appreciating the Bhagavad Gita from Sanjay's perspective. So, another way of titling this, what's so great about the Bhagavad Gita? So, I'll use an acronym GREAT, G-R-E-A-T, which will describe the five verses spoken by Sanjay. So, the Bhagavad Gita itself has 700 verses and is primarily a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna asks, over the course of the 18 chapters, Arjuna asks 17 different questions. And Krishna answers those questions. And the Krishna-Arjuna conversation ends by 18.73. 1872 is the last verse that Krishna speaks. And 1873 is the last verse that Arjuna speaks. And Arjuna says, Krishna asks, have you heard clearly? Have you understood? He says, yes, I understood. I become calm. I become confident. And that's where the Gita could have ended. But the Gita contains five more verses, which are what are spoken by Sanjay. So we look at each of these five verses and we try to focus on one theme from each of these verses, which will help us appreciate the speciality of the Bhagavad Gita. So let's look at these verses one by one. Let's try to recite it. So I'll tell the meaning first and then we'll recite it. And then we'll discuss the words. And after discussing the words, we'll try to recite it once again. And like that, we'll, I'll try to do a, about seven minutes each verse and we'll complete it in the 35 40 minutes. And we can have one or two questions at the end. So here Sanjay is speaking. Ityaham, in this way I have Vasudevasya, Parthasya Chamaatmana. So these two souls, Vasudeva, that's Krishna, and Partha is Arjuna. In this way, if the, between these two souls, Partha, Vasudeva and Partha, and what about them? Mahatmana. They are both great souls. Mahatma is singular. Mahatmana is plural. So you see, in between these two great souls, Samvadam, this discussion, this conversation, this dialogue. Idam Ashrausham. Ashrausham. I have heard. In this way, Imam, sorry. In this way, I have heard this conversation between these two great souls. Ashrausham. And Adbhutam Romaharshanam. He is describing what is the nature of this conversation. First, he says it was between two great souls. But it is also Adbhutam. It is wonderful. And Romaharshanam. How wonderful? The wonderful is a is often a very overused adjective. Oh, Prasad is wonderful, Kirtan is wonderful, devotees are wonderful, temple is wonderful, life is wonderful. And okay, it just sometimes the word becomes meaningless. Because we over because of overuse. What is it? It's so wonderful. Adbhuta Roma Shanam. Roma refers to hair. My hairs are standing up in ecstasy. So it's it's extremely thrilling, you say. So he starts by appreciating the Bhagavad Gita in this words. So let's try to recite it. Recite it. We'll recite only once and uh, responsibly. Ityaham Vasudevasya Ityaham Vasudevasya Parthasya Chamahatmanaha Parthasya Chamahatmanaha Samvadam Ima Mashrausham Samvadam Ima Mashrausham Adhutam Roma Harshanam So I'll focus on one word, Mahatmanaha. It is understood that Krishna is Mahatma. Atma means soul. Maha means great. So Mahatma is a great soul. Now literally Krishna as God is the greatest being. So he is Mahatma. But all the Bhagavad Gita itself describe and the Upanishads also echo that the soul is extremely tiny. It is so small that it is immeasurable, a prameyam. So why would such a tiny soul be referred to as Mahatma? It is that Krishna has also used this word Mahatma earlier. In the 7th chapter, 19th verse he uses it. And 9th chapter, 14th verse he uses it. For example, Bhavnam Janmanam Ante Jnanavan Mahaprapadite Vasudeva Sarvamiti Sa Mahatma Sudurlapaha 
ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಈ ನೈನ್ ಫೋರ್ಟಿ ಸತತಂ ಕೀರ್ತಯಂತೋ ಮಾಂ ಎದಂತಶ್ಚಿ ದೊಡಗತ ನಮ್ಮ ಶಂತಶ್ಚ ಮಾಂ ಭಕ್ತ್ಯ ಇತ್ತಿ ಸಾರಿ ಸೊ ನೈನ್ ಥರ್ಟಿ ಮಹಾತ್ಮಾನಸ್ತು ಮಾಂ ಪಾರ್ಥ ದೈವ್ಯಂ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ಮಾಶಿತ ವಜಂತ್ಯನ ನಿಮನಸೋ ಜ್ಞಾತ್ವ ಭೂತಾದಿ ಮೌಮೆ ಸೊ ದ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಇಸ್ physically or metaphysically which are the soul is not physical so you can the metaphysically the soul is very small so how can a small soul become a great soul so here it is saying this is a conversation between mahatmas that means sanjay is considering it is not only krishna who is a mahatma it is arjuna is also a mahatma so what makes a soul a big soul it is actually their vision of life it is their understanding of the meaning and purpose of life what do they see their life as meant for that can make a person's life very small the person's conception of life is what okay i just i want to enjoy so i eat i drink and be merry as a person <laughs> well okay at the end of your life what is the biggest achievement well for 75 years you digested food every day <laughs> what else did you do with your life so <laughs> so what happens is what makes a soul great is their understanding of the purpose of life so arjuna at the start of the gita had a small conception he says oh this i am on this side of the pandavas they are on the side of the kauravas and i have to fight against them and should i fight against them by fighting will gain a kingdom but in gaining the kingdom i lose my relatives so should i fight or not fight a is losing one's relatives worth gaining a kingdom he maybe it is not he was confused but krishna expanded arjuna's vision says this war is not just about saving your relatives or gaining a kingdom for yourself this war is meant to establish the rule of virtue in the world to establish a social order that will be conducive for spiritual well being so krishna expanded arjuna's vision to understand that his life his choices his activities were meant for something far bigger than himself and that is what the bhagavad gita can do for all of us that the bhagavad gita's message helps us all to expand our understanding of life our understanding of what my life is meant for within the materialistic conception life is ultimately meaningless we are just uh, some bags of protoplasm who somehow come up alive we flap around for some time and we may hit by a bang or we may bit by a bug and we collapse it's over it's over so is life that meaningless is life not meant for something more so no life is meant for survival the survival of the fittest now prabhupad said okay we talk about survival of the fittest but even the fittest don't survive okay. nobody survives ultimately no. survive the fittest will survive slightly longer than others but ultimately nobody survives so life is meant for something bigger what is that something bigger that is revealed in the bhagavad gita so how does the small soul become a great soul that is by linking with the great soul by linking with the great soul that when we see that we are parts of god and we have a part to play in god's plan for the world each one of us has been given certain abilities certain interests and you meant to use all of them in a mood of service in a mood of contribution and when we do that that is when our life gets enduring meaning now the bhagavad gita says that you know we work everybody has to work for living that is just natural but the gita's message is work with values don't just work selfishly don't just work a grill work with values that is broadly sattva guna living and then we all have abilities work with values to create something of value whatever we are job whatever we are family or role society work with values to create something of value 
and to realize what is our ultimate value. By working in the world in a mood of surveys, we may initially work, I want to earn money, I want to become famous. But if you maintain that attitude of surveys, slowly we start realizing that there is something more than money in life. Making money is important, but what we are making with money is even more important. What we are making with money. So work with values to create things of value. But as we do this in a mood of service, we start realizing slowly that yeah, fame in this world is temporary. Wealth, okay, it's there, but what's more important? And gradually we realize that it is the supreme Lord who is of ultimate value. And thus our vision will become directed towards it. So the great, the small soul becomes a great soul by understanding the greater purpose of life. And that is what the Gita provides. So Mahatmanaha, the Gita wants every one of us to become a great soul. To see that, to realize that our life is not just a chance incident. It's meant for meaning and purpose. So what we are is God's gift to us. What we become is our gift to God. What we are, it's God's gift to us. We have certain talents, certain interests. But what we do with those talents, with those interests, what we become is our gift to God. In this way, in this world, we can act in a way that our life can have enduring meaning. And that is what has happened to Arjuna. The previous verse describes how Arjuna aligned with the divine will. Karishe vachinam tava. I will do your will. Arjuna told Krishna. What does it mean? Arjuna, I'm not just, Arjuna realized, I'm not just fighting to win one war. I'm fighting to, to help make the world a better place. In harmony with the plan of the one being who knows what is best for everyone. Who wants the best for everyone. This is how the Gita infuses great meaning into the lives of each one of us. You may think, I am doing small things. Oh, I, you know, I just have this particular home and I have this particular job and nobody even knows whether I exist or not. Does anyone care? Well, yes, God cares. And everything that we do, it can have enduring significance. If we do it in a mood of service. So that is his realization that Mahatmana, Arjuna has also become a great soul. Because he has aligned with the divine will. And if we do that, then our life can also gain greater significance. So I'm discussing the acronym GREAT. So G is greatness. What's great about the Bhagavad Gita? This verse describes the path to greatness. It is not just achieving something wonderful in the world. That's good if we can. But it is aligning with the great soul. The greatest soul. So let's recite this verse once again. Ityaham Vasudevasya Ityaham Vasudevasya Arthasya Cha Mahatmanaha Arthasya Cha Mahatmanaha Samvadam Ima Mashrausham Samvadam Ima Mashrausham Adbhutam Roma Harshanam Adbhutam Roma Harshanam Thank you. Let's go to the next verse. So now, he's in a, in his verses, he further describe that what has his experience been. He says, I've heard Krishna and Arjuna discuss the Bhagavad Gita, but now he says his own experience. So he says, let me explain the meaning and then we will recite the words. Vyasa Prasadat. He said, his Vyasa Dev was a spiritual master and Vyasa Dev gave him a special blessing by which he could see the events of the Kurukshetra battlefield. Although he was on in Hastinapur. So Vyasa Prasada Shutvan. So it's interesting, what he had been given was mystical vision. But it's not just vision, he's not focusing on the vision. In the Bhagavad Gita, yes, sorry, after the Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata war happens and that's dramatic in terms of visuals. But the Bhagavad Gita is not very dramatic vision. Just two people having a discussion. The 11 chapter is dramatic, where Krishna reveals the universal form. But what is dramatic is the hearing, the message. So Vyasa Prasada, he is not saying Drishtva, Shrutva. 
by the mercy of Yasudev, I heard this message, Shutva. And then what is special about it? Etad Guhiyam Amparam. It is extremely, supremely confidential knowledge. Why is it called confidential? In one sense, the Bhagavad Gita is meant for everyone. Krishna and Arjuna discussed it publicly on the battlefield. In that sense, it's for everyone. But in another sense, when Krishna and Arjuna were discussing, they're just having a normal conversation between two people. So nobody on the battlefield could hear what they were discussing. They're just waiting, what is happening? So some people ask, you know, what were all the warriors doing? And Krishna and Arjuna were having this discussion. Well, actually, at least initially, as long as Bhishma was the commander, the Kauravas fought with principles. So when Bhishma saw that Krishna and Arjuna were talking something, he raised his hand, stop. And the warriors on his side stopped. And anyway, the warriors on the Pandava side had stopped. That's how they had a discussion. But nobody could hear what they were discussing. But he said, I could hear. So, Guriyam Ahamparam. And this is Yogam Yogeshwara Krishnat. That, this is the knowledge of Yoga. Yoga is connection, harmony. The knowledge of connection with the divine. Yogeshwara Krishnat. That Lord, who is the Lord of all mysticism, Yogeshwar Krishna. Sakshat Kathayata Swayam. He himself spoke this. So in the previous verse, the focus was on, this is a conversation which is thrilling. But what is thrilling about the conversation is, that the main, main conversant, or discussant, whatever the word, main uh, interpolate, uh, the interlocutor, the person who is discussing, he is not an ordinary person. It is Bhagavan, it is Krishna. Saksha Kathayata Swayam. He himself spoke these words. So, Saksha. Directly. Aksha is eyes. Saksha is before my eyes. So, it's like sense perception. I perceived it personally, you see. I perceived Krishna speaking this conversation. So, we'll discuss the theme of the acronym great. We talk about realization in this thing, R. So let's recite the verse now. Yasa Prasada Shrutvan Yasa Prasada Shrutvan Etat Guhyam Aham Param Etat Guhyam Aham Param Yogam Yogeshwara Krishna Yogam Yogeshwara Krishna Sakshat Kathayatha Swayam so here he is saying that, Prabhupada writes in these purports over here, that when we practice bhakti, the, the practice is done under the guidance of the spiritual master, just like Vyasa Prasada. He got it by the mercy of Vyasadeva, who is like his guru. But Prabhupada also says, although bhakti is practiced through the medium of the spiritual master, the experience is direct. What that means is, that each one of us has the capacity to experience God. Ultimately, we are all looking for experiences. Sometimes we think that we are all looking for pleasure. Well, yes and not exactly. If we were all looking only for pleasure, then why would horror movies be so popular? <laughs> Literally, the very name is saying it's going to horrify you. And horror and pleasure are not the same thing by any stretch of the mind. They are the opposite, you could say. So, why would somebody want to pay good money or bad money, whatever you want to say, pay money to go and watch a horror movie? So, the point is that yes, we seek pleasure, but more than pleasure, we want experiences. We want a rich variety of experiences. A rich variety of experiences that ultimately we want them to be pleasing. But we don't just want pleasure, we want a deep, rich variety of experiences. And the deepest and the richest experience is the experience of God. Because why? Because He is the deepest and the richest reality. If the Bhagavad Gita describes that everything attractive in the world 
manifests a spark of Krishna's attractiveness. Whatever it is, we find attractive. Some person is very beautiful. Somebody is very smart. Somebody is very skilled. Somebody is a brilliant athlete. Different people may have different attractive things. This is all of their attractiveness is like a drop. And that drop is coming from an ocean. And that ocean is Krishna. So, whatever is attractive in this world and whatever experience we get by, by, uh, by connecting with that attractive thing, we can get all that and much, much more if we experience Krishna. And saying that hearing Krishna speak, he says, I, I personally experienced God. This is, this is the word of God, but it is God. The, the Bible can also be said the word of God. But in the, most of the Bible is not spoken by God. It is spoken about God. But this is the word of God, literally, Krishna himself has spoken it. So when we recite the verses of the Gita, we can try to visualize that this same Krishna who is holding a flute to his lips. From those lips, the words came out. Manmana bhava mat bhakto, madhyaji maam namaskuru. Become my devotee, devote yourself to me, offer your homage and obeisances to me. And in this way, if you do this, I assure you, I declare truly, you will come to me. So these are the words spoken by Krishna. And the words spoken by God have the potency to give us the experience of God. So we all seek a dip, seek some higher experience and the highest experience is the experience of God. And what happens when we experience God, that will be described in the next verses. But here the idea is, it is not just some wise discussion. It is not just some informational discussion. It's a transformational discussion. And what is the transformation? The transformation is not just that, okay, I was doing something foolish and now I'll do something less foolish or I'll do something intelligent. That's, that's good. It's a good transformation. And the Bhagavad Gita can bring about that transformation. But the Bhagavad Gita can do much more. It can actually change the locus of our experience. We experience many things in this world and they give us some pleasure, some pain. But the Bhagavad Gita can give us experience of God. Realization of God. So Sakshavad, just the reciting the Gita can give us experience of God. So that's the realization she's talking about. And in general, Bhakti is a process that gives us realization, that gives us experience of God. And this experience is the greatest basis of one's faith. Like some people may say, I don't believe God exists. Okay, you know, that atheists may not believe in God. And God doesn't believe in atheists. <laughs> what does that mean? God understands that their atheism is just a superficial covering on them. That they are ultimately his parts. And God is working for everyone's redemption. But, but ultimately, that he wants to give us experience of himself. It's not, just a, it's not just a matter of belief. It's not just a matter of argument. He wants us to give his an experience of himself. And that experience is what is done through Bhakti. So, when, when we do Kirtans, when we come and, uh, come and we hold the deities of the Lord, when we chant the holy names, and when we recite the Bhagavad Gita, if we do this with devotion, we can experience Krishna. So, let's, that's the second part. Realization of God can offer, can come through the Gita. Let's recite the verse once again. Vyasa Prasada Shrutvan Vyasa Prasada Shrutvan Eta Duryam Aham Param Eta Duryam Aham Param Yogam Yogeshwara Krishna Yogam Yogeshwara Krishna Sakshat Kathayata Swayam Sakshat Kathayata Swayam Yes, your next verse. So now in the next two verses, he is giving us a glimpse of what the experience of God is like. So that realization of God, what is it like? 
എന്താ വെച്ചാൽ ഈസ് രാജൻ ഈസ് സ്പീക്കിംഗ് രുദ്രാഷ്ട്രം രാജൻ സംസ്മൃത്യ സംസ്മൃത്യ ഇസ് ഐ എം റിമെമ്പറിങ് അഗെയിൻ ആൻഡ് അഗെയിൻ സോ ദ കോമെൻറ്റേറ്റർ ഡിസ്ക്രൈബ് ദാറ്റ് ഹിയർ ഇറ്റ്സ് ഔട്ട് ഓഫ് എക്സ്ട്രസി ദാറ്റ് സം ടൈംസ് എ പേഴ്സൺ റിപ്പീറ്റ്സ് ദ വേൾഡ്സ് സോ സംസ്മൃത്യ സംസ്മൃത്യ ഇൻ ഫാക്ട് ദിസ് ഇസ് ദി ഓൺലി വേർസ് ദിസ് ദിസ് ആർ ദ ഓൺലി ദിസ് ദീസ് ആർ ദ ഓൺലി ദിസ് ദിസ് ആർ ദ നെക്സ്റ്റ് വേർസ് ആർ ദ ഓൺലി വേർസ് ഇൻ ദ ഗീത വേർ ദ സെയിം വേർഡ് ഇസ് റിപ്പീറ്റഡ് ട്വൈസ് there some word that are repeated like man is repeated nine times in the bhagavad gita but here there are two words are repeated first is i am remembering remembering oh rajan samshrutti samshrutti what am i remembering samvadam imam adbhutam this this wondrous conversation keshava arjuna yo punyam this conversation itself is sacred but what is it what is the result of remembering this conversation rishami cha mohur mohu i am feeling thrilled and not just once again and again i mean filled with a thrilling sensation thrilling a sensation of thrill that endures so that is his realize the result of the realization so let's recite the words rajan samsmritya samsmritya rajan samsmritya samvada mimam adbhutam കേശവാർജുനയോ പുണ്യം ഋഷാമി സോ ഇൻ ദി അക്കോണമി ഗ്രേറ്റ് ഈ ഇസ് എക്സ്ട്രസി ഹിസ് എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് എക്സ്ട്രസി ദിസ് ഇസ് വാട്ട് ഇസ് ഈ വാട്ട് ഇസ് ഹാപ്പനിങ് ഓവർ ഹിയർ ഈ സെയിം ജസ്റ്റ് റിമെമ്പറിങ് ദ മെസ്സേജ് ഓഫ് ദ ഗീത is filling me with ecstasy this meditating on the words of krishna is giving me a thrill and there are there are many books some 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 books we read and we starting why did i start reading this book also <laughs> they are so boring they are so contentless that is feel tired reading those books some books are good and yeah i read i'm happy i read them some books you want to read again and again Yeah. but some books they don't just be great books they become guide books for life the message stays in our heart and the bhagavad gita is a book like that it is but it is much more than a guide book a guide book is is like if i have a map you know okay a map is meant to guide me when i'm driving i use a map but nobody falls in love with a map <laughs> a map is a is a guide book and you use it and we value it but very few people unless somebody is a cartographer they don't fall in love with maps <laughs> even cartographers also they fall in love with the question but to to consider the gita to be a guide book alone is to undervalue the gita it is definitely a guide book but it is much much more than that it, it is not just an okay do this do this don't do this mold your life according that's what the gita's message is but through it what is happening is the words of the gita are non different from krishna in fact especially in the sri vaishnava tradition uh, there is the reciting the gita is considered to be similar to reciting the names of god it's that potent because you can get an experience of god so remembering the verses of the bhagavad gita is itself so uplifting that he is becoming ecstatic and we are often told as devotees we should remember krishna robot started so international society for krishna consciousness now why krishna consciousness because of two reasons one is that when we love krishna we will actually think about it that's the nature of love if we love someone we always think about that person but there is a speciality about krishna that by thinking about him we will develop love for him so it's not necessary that most other people in the world think about them and we develop love for them you think about them and you get tired thinking about them but <clears throat> there's one comedian he had just gone through a breakup and he said people pray to god for different things some people pray for a ferrari some people pray for a mansion some people pray for this so i just Oh, I pray for a mental off button. A mental off button. You know, our mind is just thinking about this and that and that and that. 
and quite often what we think about causes us anxiety causes dissatisfaction causes us irritation so now we can't we can't have mental off button but what we need is that we need a satisfying object of thought and many objects in this world they promise us satisfaction but eventually they leave us with dissatisfaction but krishna is the is the supremely satisfying object of thought even if we have not yet realized krishna even if we not yet attain krishna just thinking about him can bring satisfaction so thinking about krishna so that's the point it's so okay in bhakti tradition to think about krishna why because krishna thoughts are satisfying even without much from the world we can still be satisfied but how do we think about krishna you know we may say i think about krishna by oh, visualizing krishna's form and well, that's nice if we can but the words of krishna they are like a template for remembering krishna if we memorize a verse we can, we can memorize the sanskrit wonderful but even if we memorize the meaning then say if we are disturbed about something we are traveling in a crowded place and there's so much noise all around we are feeling annoyed tired just meditate just speak out the words of the gita speak out the english speak out the sanskrit and that gives us a ready made template for thinking about krishna a ready made resource is there so what has happened to sanjay can also happen to us if we meditate on krishna by meditating on his words we we'll find ourselves uplifted by our situations we we'll find ourselves filled with a sense of joy fulfillment thrill that is the that is one manifestation of realization of krishna let us recite this verse rajam samsmritya samsmritya rajam samsmritya samvadam imam adbhutam samvadam imam adbhutam keshavarjuna yo punyam vishami cha mohur mohur vishami cha mohur mohur now after describing this as he is meditating on krishna's words what happens is his thoughts are naturally going to krishna the person the form of krishna so from the words the form is manifesting just like if we love someone if we think about something they said then naturally we don't we don't think about those words in a depersonalized context the words floating in vacuum <laughs> now we think about oh this person spoke this so that's that's personalism that is personalism is we think about so what somebody has spoken but we also think about who has spoken it so there is a natural elevation of thoughts from the words to the source of those thoughts and that is what is described in this words so touch the some so touch the that some smooth to some smooth i am remembering again and again what am i remembering rupam atyadbhutam hare i am remembering the atyadbhutam earlier is the word wonderful adbhutam but now atyadbhutam he is running out of superlatives <laughs> very wonderful atyadbhutam hari the very wonderful form of hari and what is he saying vismayo me maha nirajan and i am i'm stunned by it vismit i am um, you could say that i am what is the word i am dumbstruck vismayo i'm stunned and i'm astounded vismayo me mahan raja i'm greatly astounded and then again rishami cha puna puna i'm thrilled again and again so again two reports are there samshrutya samshrutya and earlier it was muhu muhu now it is puna puna that's his ecstasy coming out so now is i'm meditating on the form of the lord and that is filling me with ecstasy so let's recite the verse तच्च संस्मृत्य संस्मृत्य रूपमत्यभुत हरे विस्म मे महाराजी चुनः पुनः सो हिर् गीता कॉमेंटेटर्स आर समोर डिवाइडेड 
that which form is being referred to over here. Rupa Pratya Adhutam I am remembering that extraordinary form of the Lord. So most Gita commentators say that this is referring to the Vishwa Rupa. That in the 11th chapter, Arjuna had, Arjuna had asked for and Krishna had shown this majestic all universe pervading form. It was astonishing. So you come to a temple and you offer obeisances because you see the deities Lord over here. But imagine you come to a temple and all direction there are deities. And where do we offer obeisances? So that's what happens to Arjuna. He says, he wants to offer obeisances. He says, Namaha Purastadha Pushtitaste Namostute Sarvata Eva Sarva. He says, I offer you obeisances from the front, from the back, from all directions. He says, I offer you hundreds of obeisances. So that form was wondrous. So that is the general understanding of the Acharyas. But the Gaudiya commentators, if you would give a, you could say a deeper understanding. They say that yes, the wondrous universal form that Krishna had shown was, was amazing. But actually that form came from Krishna's two-handed form. It was through Krishna's two-handed form that that wondrous form was revealed. So, how much more wonderful is Krishna's two-handed form? So, Sanjay is not just meditating on the universal form, he is meditating on the personal two-handed form of Krishna. Prabhupada says the, the, the universal form is, is great to meditate on, or rather, is great to appreciate God's greatness. But how do you love the two-handed, the universal form? It's like the sky is great. But how do I love the sky? What do I do? So we need God to manifest in a form that is human-like. And it's not that God is manifesting, that is God, God's original form. So the Atya Adbhutam, the Adbhuta Rupa is the Vishwa Rupa. But the Atya Adbhuta Rupa, the extremely wonderful form, that is the Krishna Rupa. Mm -hmm. And the test for that is, Krishna had shown Arjuna the universal form. Arjuna said, thank you, but please show me your two-handed form. So he preferred the two-handed form. So this is, what happens is, the meditation rises more and more. So here, so we take an acronym GREAT. So E was ecstasy, A is absorption. He's becoming absorbed in the Gita. Absorbed in Krishna, not just the Gita. But so the Gita and, the, and Krishna have a natural link. And here also there's one more important point. Uh, that, see, through this, Actually, the Gita is demonstrating its own teachings. So we, we can learn how Sanjay is appreciating the Gita, and that is good. Say so if we if some if we hear there was a wonderful class somewhere, but we couldn't attend the class. Now we were deciding should I hear the recording or not. But then somebody's attended the class, they say, Oh, the class was amazing, there are so many insights, such brilliant question answers. When they praise the class, then we feel inspired, oh maybe I should hear the class. So it's like Sanjay's praise of the class, of the Bhagavad Gita class, is meant to inspire us to hear the Gita. So it's like that, the last five verses. But along with that, actually Sanjay is also demonstrating the Gita. Now how is that? See, one of the teachings of the Gita is that be detached from the fruits of your work. That when, when you work, whether you get success or failure, be detached. So, what happens is, Krishna speaks the Gita to Arjuna and Krishna's speaking is successful in the sense that Arjuna becomes enlightened. Arjuna, uh, Arjuna's heart is transformed. Now Sanjay speaks the same message to Dhritarashtra. But is Dhritarashtra's heart transformed? What do you think? No, he is still remains attached. So was Sanjay speaking the Gita in vain? We could say that sometimes we give a we talk with somebody, maybe somebody is an atheist and we try to talk with them and try to talk about Krishna and God. And they say thanks, but no thanks. We say, I failed. I couldn't succeed in changing this person's mind or heart. So Sanjay could have been despondent like that. But Sanjay is not despondent. So Sanjay in one sense is demonstrating detachment. He did his duty. As a, his duty was to transmit the event that were happening on the battlefield. And he did that. And 
he is although the words that he has spoken are not transformed Dhritarashtra, Sanjay has not become rejected by that. So Sanjay is in that sense demonstrating the Gita's lesson of detachment. Stay equipoised. However, Sanjay is demonstrating something more. Because detachment is one level of the lesson of the Gita. That is the lesson at the level of Karma Yoga. But the Gita's teachings evolve from Karma Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. And we could say, uh, in Bhakti Yoga, the emphasis is not on detachment. Krishna says, be detached from the fruits of your work so that you can become attached to something far bigger than the fruits of your work. And look at this, be detached from the fruits of your work so that you can become attached to something far bigger than the fruits of your work. What is that something bigger? That is Krishna. So it's like, say suppose there's a, there's a super wealthy father, a billionaire, or a millionaire, billionaire, trillionaire, zillionaire, whatever is the highest. Super wealthy father. And now that father wants to test his son. That how responsible is my son? He tells the son, okay, you take a, I have a supermarket, you take a job in the supermarket. And you work in the supermarket. And it's okay. Now when he's working in the supermarket, he will naturally want to try to make some sales. If the father will not just a supermarket, the entire chain of supermarkets across the world is in it. And he's trying to make a sale. And he will try his best to make a sale. But suppose some customer is very disagreeable. And sometimes some customers, they ask for a hundred products and they don't buy one more. And then the person who is showing it all, they have, to, they have to fix it all up and keep it all back. And they get annoyed. Now, here, this particular person, who, who is now the billionaire, trillionaire son, he is also trying to make a sale. And he will be happy if he makes a sale. But his purpose is not just to make a sale. His purpose is to please his father. If he makes a sale, he might get some commission. He might get a salary. But if he pleases his father, he'll get the entire inheritance. But if he becomes too attached to making the sale itself, and a customer doesn't take it, and he gets angry and yells at the customer, and then what will happen is, the father will think, you, know, you are not mature enough. You can't handle one customer. How will you handle a business with millions of customers? So he in, if he becomes too attached to that immediate result, he will lose the big result. Mm. So what has happened over here, what is being demonstrated is that Sanjay is not just detached. He spoke the Gita, but that Gita did not transform Dhritarashtra's heart. However, just speaking the Gita transformed Sanjay's heart. Sanjay's heart has become enriched with remembrance of the Gita and remembrance of Krishna. And thus he has become absorbed. So in both ways, through attachment from immediate results and, sorry, detachment from immediate results and attachment to the ultimate reality. Both are being demonstrated here in the Gita. That is, Sanjay became enriched with absorption of Krishna. He is so absorbed that the fact that his message to the Dhritarashtra didn't work doesn't matter. So similarly, when we try to share bhakti with others, we try to give books, we try to share some wisdom, sometimes others may accept, others may not accept. But if we try to do it in the mood of service, our connection with Krishna will become stronger and we will become devotionally enriched. Let's recite this verse. Tacha samsmitya samsmitya Tacha samsmitya samsmitya Rupam atyatmutam hare Rupam atyatmutam hare Vismayome mahan rajan Vismayome mahan rajan Vishyami cha puna puna Vishyami cha puna puna Last ones. So, so now here, this is the conclusion. He is saying, Yatra, where? Now, where? Yatra can mean where? Or it can also mean wherever. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna. Let me explain that in a second. 
So wherever there is that mystical Lord Krishna and Yatra Partho Dadudhara, wherever there is Arjuna who is, who is, who is the wielder of the moon, Tatra Shreer Vijayo Bhutir, there, there we, Shreer is, the, is opulence, Vijay, victory, Bhutir, there we, great power, Dhruva Nitir Matir Mama, and suddenly there will be morality over that. This is my opinion. Matir Mama. So here, Sanjay, in one sense, is completing the cycle of the Gita, which began with the start first words. First verse was, Dhritarashtra asked Sanjay, what happened in the Kurukshetra battle? Dharma Kshetra, Kurukshetra, Samaveta Yudhsava, Mama Kapa and Vachayiva, Kimakurvata Sanjay. So, this is what happened in the battle. That's the question. But there is a, see there is a, many times when people ask, there is a, how should I put it, there is a, there is a spoken question and there is an unspoken question. Hmm? So if somebody comes to our home and says, have you had your lunch? That is the spoken question. The unspoken question is, can I have some lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Not always, but sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so, when he is asking what happened, suppose somebody says, that, suppose there are sports matches there, maybe baseball match or, or say some elections are there. So, he asks what happened, what is the news? Now, we are asking for the news, but ultimately what we are asking, who won, who lost? So, that is the question which Arjuna asked, uh, sorry, Dhritarashtra asked Sanjay and that he is indirectly answering. He say wherever there is Krishna, wherever there is Arjuna, there will be victory. <laughs> he says, your sons are not going to be victorious. <laughs> he is not telling him directly that. Indirectly. So an indirect question merits an indirect answer. <laughs> so that is the beautiful cyclicity of the Bhagavad Gita. But along with that, this last verse raises a question. The the question is that in one sense we can say wherever there is Krishna, there will be victory. Isn't it? Krishna is the Supreme Lord. He is the Lord of the Goddess of Fortune. So wherever he is, there will be fortune, there will be victory. So why does this verse have to mention Arjuna? He could just have said wherever there is, God, wherever there is Krishna, that's how there will be victory. So why does this verse mention Arjuna? And that is the key significance that the purpose of the Gita is not just to proclaim God's position that God is great wherever God is there will be victory the purpose of the Gita is to transform man's disposition man human disposition because. so the, the Krishna could have won the war by himself he did not need Arjuna but he wanted Arjuna to be a part. And the, this verse contains the word Dhanur Dharaha. Dhanur Dhara means Arjuna has picked up his bow in readiness to fight. So earlier, at the start of the Gita, Arjuna had put his bow down in dejection, in confusion. And now he has picked up his bow. So the purpose of the Gita is to demonstrate how by hearing the Gita, the human will is aligned with the divine will and the human who aligns with the divine will be victorious. That is the point of the Gita. So the Gita is meant to transform human disposition, to inspire the human will to align with the divine will. And that is the last part of the great acronym, G-R-E-A-T, T is transformation. The transformation of the human will we all may be discouraged in life, we may be confused, we may have, we may be angry, frustrated, resentful, whatever emotions might come in our life. But oh, if we hear the Gita, we all can be transformed. So what happens is that Arjuna's Gandiva bow can be said to represent our enthusiasm, our determination. Sometimes life's challenges, life's struggles, we just disorder us. Quick, I give up. I can't do it. But if we hear the Gita, we all will be inspired to pick up our Gandhi Baba, 
we will all be filled with enthusiasm and determination. Yes, there are many problems in the world. But in spite of whatever problems are there, God's will is still working. God's plan is still operational. That no matter how big problems are, God is still bigger. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna does not promise a stormless sea. But he does provide an unsinkable ship. He does not provide us, promise a stormless sea. Storms are the Arjuna's life. But if we understand that if we align with Krishna's will, no matter how many difficulties come, ultimately our life's mission will be successful. Our, not just life's mission, our multi-life journey will be triumphant. That is the assurance that the Gita gives. And that is the conviction that comes in the heart of one who studies the Gita. And that is the ultimate transformation that we all can have. That we can be enthused, we can be energized, we can become determined. And we can all fulfill our God-given potentials in this world and beyond. Let's recite this verse. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dhanutara Tatra Shri Rivijayo Bhuti Dhruvani Tirma Tirma So I'll summarize. I spoke on the topic of what's so great about the Gita based on the acronym great, appreciating Sanjay's Gita from the Sanjay's perspective. So does anyone know what was G? Great. Greatness. Greatness. Yeah. The small soul can become a great soul, Mahatma, when that small soul aligns with the great soul. So our life is not meaningless, it has great meaning if we see our existence as a part of the Lord's plan. So what we are is God's gift to us, what we become is our gift to God. That was the first verse, 1874. Then 1875, R was? Realization. Now, the Gita doesn't just tell us that God has a higher plan. The Gita's message, the Gita's words have the potency to give us experience of God. And that experience is so fulfilling. We all see different experiences. But this experience is so fulfilling that all other attractive experiences, they become like drops in front of the ocean of experience that is God. Then, that was 1875. Then, E is? Ecstasy. Ecstasy. So, by meditating on the words of just by speaking the Gita, what happens is, he becomes, Sanjay becomes thrilled in remembering the Gita. Prishyamj, Mohur Mohur, Puna Puna, Samsmutya Samsmutya, those words come out. So, we all can become filled with ecstasy just by remembering the words of the Gita. So the words of the Gita are like a template, a ready-made template for remembering Krishna. And the next was seventeen absorption. So not just that is ecstasy in remembering the words of the Gita, but from the words of the Gita, the form of Krishna manifests. And remembering that form is extremely enriching and absorbing. And last T was transformation. transformation. The purpose of the Gita is to transform human disposition to fill us with the inspiration that no matter how many difficult how many storms come on the sea that we are in we have an unsinkable ship that unsinkable ship is our readiness to serve God our willingness to take up our bow and enthusiastically diligently do, do try to serve God in whatever situation we are in in that way our life's mission will be ultimately supremely successful. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Do we have time for only one question? We have to yes, You can ask that. Uh, did you not come back to us? I was asked by one of the congregation members, since you told us Sanjay, did you, did you come across the question, who was the Sanjay in the previous life? Okay. Who was Sanjay in his previous life? But in general, the Bhagavad Gita's focus is not so much on who was who in previous life. Yeah, 
Yeah, I haven't heard anything about Sanjay's previous life. So, so, okay. Yes, please. Hi, Krishna. Thank you so much for that class. I feel like really inspired to read Bhagavad Gita. And I was thinking how um, Sanjay's those last five verses are like testimonial. Like we all like, we like reviews, we like book reviews and things that will um, inspire us to want to read the book. And so when we get to the end, we read that, we're like, oh, now I'm going to start again. So it's kind of a nice um, package. In Thank you. Good testimonial. Yes. Hi, Krishna. So, Prabhu, we talked about alignment with the with of the God. So, how do we make these choices in our, in our life we have to face day in, day out? I mean, the overall um, uh, answer, I, I mean, I said that you know what if it is conducive to our Krishna consciousness our choices should be for that. So sometimes it's not that easy to understand what is you know conducive yeah. even. So how do we where is the checkpoint and what should we do? Yes. That's a big question. I was expecting that in my family. How do we align with the will of the Lord? Well I would say three parts to the answer. I'll try to keep it brief. The first is that where the will of God is known for us, we try to do that. That means, say for example, we do know that we, we should practice bhakti. You know, we should do our sadhana, we should study, study scriptures, come in the social devotees. That is clear. And there are also certain activities which, are, which we know are anti-devotional, immoral, we should try to avoid. Now, there is a, it's possible that we may not have the willpower and present to do all those things. But at least what we know is God's will and what we can do, we should do. Because ultimately Krishna is in our heart. And if he sees that we want to do his will, he will reveal his will more and more to us. That's why so I start with what we know we should be doing. Here. So one definition of intelligence is to know what to do when we don't know what to do. <laughs> so I don't know what to do in this situation. So what do I do? I turn and pray. This is what I need. I need guidance. Now it's not necessary that suddenly some flash of lightning will come and we know. But we are at least in that area doing the right thing. So the second is, second part is that in general, God's will is not like one line. It's an overall direction. It's not that Krishna wants us to be like robots. This is what you do, otherwise you condemn. No, he has, it is he who has given us our individuality. And he wants to us to use our individuality. So our intelligence, our individuality, we use it. In the spiritual world, where the gopis cook for Krishna, at one level, sometimes is it that Krishna reveals from within his, their hearts what I want to eat today. The gopis says, you know, I want to cook this for Krishna. And they cook it one day, Krishna likes it. So there's a reciprocation of love. So it's not that you know, if we if I don't do this, oh, then my life is doomed because I didn't do Krishna's will. No, Krishna's will is a direction. And sometimes even if we go off direction, as long as we try to realign with Krishna, we'll come back. So we shouldn't lament too much if we don't know Krishna's will or if we do something else. It's like if we are using a GPS and the GPS says turn right. And then we somehow turn, we don't hear or we don't understand, we turn left. What does the GPS do? You didn't obey me, get lost. <laughs> GPS doesn't do that. Immediately it reroutes. Reroutes and again throws the right. So even if we go off track sometimes, it's not like one line if we don't go on, we are doomed forever. No. Krishna will guide us from wherever we are going. And the third part is the third part is that we can say God's Will is what is best for us. Like, like what we do, God's will, that's what is best for us. But also, we can say God's will is in what is best for us. That means we use our God given intelligence and we try to understand what is what is the good thing to do in this situation. So in the Mahabharat, when Abhimanyu is killed, Arjuna is shattered. 
and Arjuna lashes out in anger at his own brothers. Says, Couldn't you protect my son? Are all your weapons just ornaments? At that time, Krishna approaches Arjuna and he hugs him from the side and he says, Oh Arjuna, in this world, adversities befall everyone. Good, the good people and the bad people, the wise people and the unwise people. But what differentiates the two is that the wise people act in ways that decrease the suffering. Whereas the unwise people act in ways that increase the suffering. So, oh Arjuna, look around you. Your brothers are suffering just the way you are suffering. They also love you and you. Pray, oh Arjuna, don't speak words that will increase their pain. So ultimately, Krishna is the valuation of everyone. Krishna wants everything to be better. So whatever situation we are in, we think, what can I do to make things better in this situation? So if we say, I don't know what to make things better. Well, okay, can I, two choices are there for me. One step forward. What, can I do something which will make things better? You know, if we are having a, well, like a tough relationship and a harsh altercation in that relationship, I don't know what will make things better. When the other person is yelling, I yell back. That's not going to make things better. So let me try to come up. So just think, in that sense, service attitude doesn't have to mean something mystical or otherworldly. Like you said, it's what is favorable for Krishna consciousness. But ultimately, if our material life is better organized, more stable, that is favorable for our Krishna consciousness. So you just ask yourself, what can I do to make things better? And don't think sometimes in too much long term because we can't think. Okay, in the next one hour, if I were to act my best self, what would my best self do? There are a dozen problems, dozen things to do, and I don't know how to deal with them. But if I were my best self, in the next one hour, what would my best self do? Okay, maybe I just note down things one, two, three, and I'll do these things. I'll put other things aside. So just small things that we do like that. That will also. That is also actually in God's way. Because whatever resources God has given us, He wants us to use them. So imagine if uh, some billionaire father gives their child a very expensive computer on which they can do graphic design or something like that. And then the child is asking the parents, what can I do to please you? So I gave you a gift, use it. So that will please me. So God has given us some abilities, some interests, some talents. Just using them will please him. Using them constructively will please him. So in this way, three things. First is, where we know God's will, do it. Where we know what is the right thing to do. Second is, that don't lament too much if we don't know God's will. Because God's will is not a line, it's a direction. Even if we go off track, it will bring us back. And just ask the question, what can I do to make things better? And take, what can I do to make things better? and take small steps accordingly. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Just a quick announcement. Much of what I spoke today is from my book, Relishing Bhagavad Gita. I wrote two books recently on the Bhagavad Gita, Relishing Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavad Gita Insights. Both those books are available and also calendar with around 365 quotes is on Bhagavad Gita also available over there in the table. If any of you would like to have that, we have a few copies still remaining. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.